Honoring our grads is a special day. I remember when I graduated high school, we had a baccalaureate service at church. All of the graduates were introduced, and we were all asked what our plans are next. And some were going to college, and some were going to work. My favorite, my favorite answer was John's. He said, I'm going home, and I'm going to sleep. His highest motivation was to be out, be done, and get some rest. We read the Beatitudes this morning. Thank you, Ella. We have recognized and seen who our grads are so that we know how to pray for them. And I'm going to speak to you guys this morning. I'm going to preach to the young ones. By the way, Scott, you saw the size of their gifts. Those are study Bibles. It's not a secret. I'm going to tell you what it is, okay, because we want you to establish your lives firmly upon the truth of God's Word. We were going to get one for you, but the large print edition was this big. <laughs> No, that, there is a lesson here, by the way, that, it, that I think that, that you guys and, frankly, all of us need to know, and that is that learning never stops. Amen? Learning never stops, and it is quite an a, a accomplishment to continue learning and to be credentialed and to excel at the, at the doctorate level at a school like Southwestern. Great job, brother. And high school grads, man, you made it. Isn't that great? So, everybody's asking, what are you going to do with the rest of your life? And I want you to, to, at least it's a good time to stop and think about this. Are you going to get a job? Are you going to go to school? Are you going to go both? At some point, you're going to want to start a family probably. You certainly want to be healthy, but how many of you want to be happy? I'm talking about blessed and happy and content. It's a good thing that we're studying the Beatitudes because Jesus gives us very clear instructions for what it means to be happy what it means to be blessed and don't be surprised by this folks Jesus is concerned with your blessedness with your happiness with your contentment and with your satisfaction the confusing thing when you look at these beatitudes is this nobody else is saying this nobody says to be happy you should recognize that you're spiritually bankrupt and poor except the Lord Jesus Christ. The world didn't say that. Nobody says that to be happy, you should be sad and mourn. Uh, it, it, it turns the world's thinkings upside down. It's no surprise that you're going into a world that needs Jesus, a world that Jesus came to save. And to borrow a phrase, I want to urge you, don't waste your life. Don't waste your life on things that don't matter. Rather, invest your life on things that have eternal value. And that's for all of us. Whether has, God has put you or will put you, wherever God has put you or will put you, you can know that God has a purpose for your life and that as you come to know him, you can be a part of his work. He lives his life and accomplishes heavenly, eternal value in you and through you. Now, I do want to tell you, I do think there's a lot of misunderstanding in the world today about what it means to be a Christian. Some people think that Christianity is just knowing about God and and, and that's basically what it means. Others think it means just being a good person and having values and being ethically moral. Some think it's more than that. It's even just being religious. It's joining a church. It's going. It's giving and participating in church activities. That was the case in Jesus' day, and it's certainly the case today. When Jesus came and he preached, though, he made it clear that none of those things are what make you right with God. None of those things open the pathway to forgiveness and cleansing. None of those things make you a Christian, a Christian who walks with Christ. None of those things will get you into heaven when you die. None of these things will allow you to have genuine peace with God while you live, but there is a way. Jesus came not only to share the way, Jesus came to be the way. And this is the Sermon on the Mount, the introduction to the Sermon on the Mount. This is the first sermon that we have recorded that Jesus ever preached. And he begins with happiness. He begins with blessedness. And he tells them, first, you need to be poor in spirit. Recognize that you can't get to God on your own. You can't make yourself right with God. You need someone outside of you. You need Jesus to save you. The only one who is perfect and perfectly righteous can have a relationship with God. The question is, are you going to rely on your righteousness or are you going to put your trust in the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ? When you, when you begin to understand that there's a loving God who wants for you to know him, really know him, and when you realize you can't get to him, you mourn and grieve. Blessed are they who mourn, for they shall be comforted. You're in sin, separated from God. That is a mournful condition. When you turn to God, he comforts you. He makes things right. 
but don't go to God with attitude like we so often have all right God I'll serve you if God I need you to do this God if I come to you will you make this bad thing go away God if I come to you will you fix this problem in my life I want you to recognize God doesn't owe you anything there is no inherent obligation of God to you you need to recognize that we haven't earned anything except for judgment so don't hand God your agenda don't hand him your goals and your plans with an attitude of I'll be yours if there is no if in coming to Christ that's why blessed are the poor in spirit we need God blessed are they that mourn I mourn over my sin that is separated from me from God God comforts me but blessed are the meek, blessed are the humble, the gentle, those who approach God in submissiveness. Now, I don't like being hungry. I never thought of hunger as something good. But Jesus describes a good hunger, a hunger and a thirst after righteousness, a passionate desire for righteousness, for his righteousness, for him, the only one who is perfectly righteous. When Jesus becomes what you want most, good news, he fills you and he satisfies you. Now, at this stage of your life, you're thinking about, all right, what do I want most? You know, it's like, it may be to go home and take a nap. It may be to get a job. It may be to get into a school. It may be to get out of a school. It may be to get a job uh, or to excel at the job that you're in. It may, whatever it is that you want the most, when you come to Christ, you recognize that our desire is to be fully planted on Him. And as we desire Him and please Him and pursue Him, then he fills us and he satisfies us. And he will direct us in different ways. And our life will have different expressions. But he is faithful throughout it all. And he fills us up. I drive a Ram pickup truck. It's just a standard cab. There's no place to put stuff in the, in the, in the cab in the back. Which was by design because I'm a collector. Any of you guys collectors? Is you, do y'all keep your cars clean? All right. Before we went on the men's retreat, Suzanne said, well, you need to clean out the truck. Would you bring your coffee cups in? Eleven coffee cups. <laughs> I carried it into the house. Some of them were paper. I threw those away. But the, the, the six or seven thermos mugs, I have, but I have, a, uh, I have a vinyl floor. And when I washed out the truck the other day, it looked like somebody poured coffee on the floor because when you mix water with the coffee that was already on the floor, it just kind of floated right on up. But I, I, I wear my coffee, just so that you'll know, which is another good reason for ties and coats, by the way. But I tend to wear my coffee. My cups often overflow. There's an old song that I love. It has the phrase, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord. And there's a song that was written based off of the, the 23rd Psalm, and it says, My cup runneth over. The picture there is that, Jesus Christ fills you and he fills you to overflowing now graduates today I'm not going to give you a list of things to do there's no homework assignment but the text doesn't do that but it does describe character that God desires to work in you here's an important truth and I want I want you all to get it there's been a great blood one of these grads by the way is my grandson Keegan there he is and uh, yeah, I've known him since he was born and seeing how God is, has worked in his life, and he's, he's going off to school uh, in the fall, got the summer before he gets there. But this is a, a massive accomplishment. And uh, one of the things that my dad told me as we were coming up is character matters. A Christian is something before he does something. A Christian is something who does who, who, who is something before he does anything. This is not a task list. This is a, a, a character description that God creates within us. It all starts with who we are. Let, let me connect these Beatitudes together if I can, because the first ones that we looked at and these four that we're looking at today go together. Those who are poor in spirit acknowledge their need of mercy which is the first one we're looking at today and willing to show mercy to others those who mourn over their sin and desire to wash their hearts clean with tears of repentance they become pure in heart 
The meek or the gentle are those who spontaneously make peace because their own agenda is not the issue. They're concerned about others. And those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, if you look at verses 10 and 11, they'll be persecuted for the sake of righteousness. So there's some wonderful parallels as you see the first four and what flows out of them. But I want to talk about the first characteristic, and it's mercy. Do we know what mercy is? If you look up in the dictionary, it says mercy is withholding justice from someone that you have the power to give it to. There's a whole other component to mercy. The Greek, the Hebrew word in the Old Testament is hesed. And it's most often translated loving kindness. God is merciful. One of the things that we talked about at the misery tree was King David. And King David t- depended upon the mercy of God. He needed to just like we needed to. And the way he starts Psalm 51 is have mercy upon me, O God. Not, not because I earn it, not because I deserve it, but according to thy loving kindness. Wash me from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. So mercy has two components. It, one of them is simply forgiveness. It's releasing a debt that's owed. It, it is uh, letting someone off the hook, if you will. It's forgiveness. But the other one is caring. It's being a caring person. It's being uh, one that is filled with the character of Christ in loving kindness. And it is God's character. The psalmist says in 103.8, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. This verse re- reflects and shows the biblical understanding that God's mercy is boundless and enduring. Was Jesus merciful? There, there might be a quiz occasionally during the service. Was Jesus merciful? Yes. How many times do we see the mercy of Christ? He showed mercy to the poor, to the outcast, to the prostitutes, to the sorrowing, to the lonely, to the unloved, to even to the rebellious. Once, Jesus stopped a funeral procession, no indication that he knew who they were, but he restored a young man to life because of his grief at the sorrow of his widowed mother. In John 8, Jesus was merciful to a harlot and said, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Jesus showed care and compassion with those that others wouldn't. He ate with tax collectors and sinners, a definite sign of his mercy toward the the outcast. So whatever else mercy may be, it is something from God that he forms in you when you realize that you only know him because he had mercy on you poor in spirit mourning humbly approaching God when you recognize you can only know God because of his mercy toward you then you begin to have mercy upon others Titus chapter 3 verse 5 says he saved us not because of the righteous we had done righteous things we had done but because of his mercy he saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit and then we're commanded to be merciful to, uh, to others, to bear with each other and to forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. There's a lot we could talk about when it comes to mercy, but I want to give you a sentence to write down and to remember. This is a to-do. The application of this that I would encourage for you to consider is you to care for people by forgiving them. People will offend you and people will hurt you. Some people will do it intentionally. Some people will do it carelessly. But you must learn to forgive in order that you may care and be a person filled with loving kindness. Don't hold on to hurts. I played basketball in middle school. Don't I look like a basketball player? Y'all wonder why I don't play out here with you guys, okay? I have an identical twin brother. I'm a twin too, guys. I have a twin brother, and uh, we were the backbone of our church basketball team. I mean, we were the backbone of our church basketball team. Middle school, remember? Okay. And we were, in a word, we were just not good. (laughs) Not a lot of skill here when it came to basketball. But then we went to a school, and they said, we're looking for basketball players. And Mark and I looked at each other and thought, we play basketball. And so we signed up for the team. We didn't last real long. But we got out there, and the coach said, can you play basketball? And one of the guys who was really, really good, uh, John Wayne Finnegar, he said, all right, guys, come on. We, we need some basketball players. You guys play. And he starts throwing us the ball, and we start doing some plays. And he's like, you guys can't play ball. <laughs> and then he looked. He was joking with some friends, and he talked about me. He said, Marty, he's so bad, he can't even dribble down his chin. (laughs) 
Now, I'm 60 now, and it's funny. <laughs> but when I was in middle school, it wasn't funny at all. We thought we were okay. We didn't think we were all that, but we thought we were okay. And, buddy, we weren't. And, and I'm not going to bring my brother into this. I was a, the brunt of a number of jokes for a long time because of my basketball prowess. But I didn't like John Wayne anymore. His name was John Wayne Pinnegar. I don't talk about the movie star. I didn't like John Wayne anymore. I, I, matter of fact, I was mad at him. And that, that just kind of settled in. You know, what, you know what unforgiveness feels like? You know what resentment feels like? It just settles in. It just settles in. And the world is full of people who don't forgive, who got their feelings hurt, it shaped their perception of themselves. It shaped their interaction with others. The world is full of people who are bitter and angry and hold on to hurts. And yet our God has been offended more than any being ever. And his character is mercy and loving kindness. Listen to me, guys. Be ye kind one to another, tender hearted. Forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Having, when you guys are going to know all these Beatitudes by the time we get done, but having been poor in spirit and recognizing our need, mourning that and coming to God humbly and seeking Him, He cleanses us and He washes us and He forgives us, and we are forgiven much. And then we are called to be those who forgive others. Don't go through life holding on to hurts. Rather, allow Christ in you to do that which you cannot perfectly. He can perfectly in you. Release the debt. When you forgive, you're the one who is set free. And it finds a place, this forgiveness finds a place in your heart and mind. There's a natural progression to the next beatitude. It is blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. When we recognize we need saving, that only God can save us. When we mourn over our condition, when we approach God with humility, abandoning our own agenda. When we, having seen him, we hunger and thirst for him and his righteousness. And we remember the mercy that he had upon us. He changes our hearts to be merciful to others hard stuff and this is not behavior modification parents this is not behavior modification this is character development and it is the character of Christ that God is working in every child of God it's essential this becomes a significant change in our attitudes he gives us a new heart a new mind I was reading this past week about Saul and when Saul was first anointed as king of Israel, and Samuel said, here, and he gave him a list of four things he was going to encounter on his way to his presentation to the people, and they had not approved him yet. But Saul, Samuel also told Saul, at this point, God's going God's to change you. He was physically looking like a king, but inwardly he was not. And in, uh, what is it, First Samuel uh, chapter 10, verse 7, or 3, verse 7, I'll look it up. As he turned away from Samuel to go walk this path, it says, And God gave Saul a new heart. Isn't that great? Isn't that great? God gave Saul a new heart. My prayer is that God will give you a new heart if he has not yet. But this new heart has a capacity, a heart of flesh that he places within us that is a capacity to be conformed to the image of Christ. But the Bible says the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? In Genesis, God said every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So the heart is what we think, and it's what we feel. The heart is our person, our inner person. And can a leopard change its spots? Can a short person become a tall person just by wishing it so? Can we, <laughs> amen, can we do something? Only God can do, can change, can make us new. And so blessed are those who are pure in heart, 
katharos from the Greek, katharizo, which means to cleanse from filth and impurity. It means that we have a heart that has been cleansed by God. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. It's something that we long for and desire for. It's something that God does for us when he washes us and he cleanses us and he makes us his own in justification. It is something that God is continually doing for us as we walk in obedience to him. Here's the sad thing about about graduation it's not sad here's what we need to remember about graduation it is a step in the process it's not the end you celebrate the accomplishment but something comes next and it should be a progression of drawing closer to God of learning more of being better equipped of the continual transformation that God works in our hearts blessed are the pure in heart and that's simply those who are seeking after God those who are experiencing the washing and cleansing of the Holy Spirit not only initially at salvation but on a daily basis a practice of confession and repentance and trust and cleansing Uh, in church we call it sanctification it's becoming more than you were it's allowing Christ to be formed in you We separate ourselves from sin as we endeavor to live out a very practical purity. Hey, guys, a lot of temptation in the world. A lot of temptation. There are a lot of things that will be enticing to you. There are a lot of things that will draw you to, 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 certainly away from God, away from God's word, away from God's truth. And some of them are blatant. Matter of fact, you'll get mail, you'll get now that you graduated you'll start getting mails and ads and invitations for all kind of things that will feed your pleasure and feed your flesh and will seek to be an invitation a temptation to you so you have those over but you also have those more subtle temptations that show up from our own flesh and from our own context and even people that we trust here's the command as you walk close to god he will keep your heart clean He will keep your heart pure. I want to summarize pure in heart simply with a couple of words that help us with practical purity, and that is integrity and sincerity. Now, sincerity is not enough because you can be sincerely wrong. You agree with that, right? Every Clemson fan thinks a Carolina fan is sincerely wrong, while we Carolina fans know it's just the opposite. No. (laughs) probably shouldn't have brought football into this sincerity is important but it's not sufficient you want to be wholehearted you want to be sincere sincere simply means without wax nothing hidden the mask down you want to be all in but you want to be all in in the right things the things that matter the things that matter for eternity purity and righteousness and holiness and loving God and seeking after him and so you have integrity honesty of character simply doing what you say you're going to do and so the the way that you have purity of heart here's your application statement make pleasing God your priority I want you to make pleasing God your priority every day should be a day where you say father how can I please you today father how can you use me today father how can I know you more today And that brings us to the third one. Blessed are the peacemakers. You guys make peace at your home? Isn't this great? You guys know what an agitator is? Somebody keeps things stirred up. Do y'all like drama? Is there a lot of drama in the world? There's a lot of drama. There is a lot of drama in the world. The problem is we need to understand what peace is. Blessed are the peacemakers. We need to be those who have received peace. And sometimes we think peace is just an absence of war. I don't know if you were raised in a, or, uh, in, a, in a fighting household. I don't know if you were uh, uh, exposed to an environment coming up that was filled with conflict and a lot of arguing back and forth. Sometimes you just want everybody just to be quiet. The problem is we think that's peace, and that's not the peace that we're talking about here. Peace is more than emptiness. It's more than a vacuum. It's more than an absence of war and conflict. Back when I was in college, peace at any cost became a, a, a theme kind of for a group of kids on the campus that I went to. But that's not what we're talking about here. We're not talking about evading important issues. We're not talking about 
peace by being a people pleaser. Any of, any of you guys know those? Do we all have those tendencies in our heart? I disagree. This is wrong, but I want them to think well of me, or I don't want them to be riled up, or I just don't want any kind of confrontation. So I'm just going to be quiet, or I'm just going to be a people pleaser. We don't want to create strife. We don't want to stir stuff up. But at the same time, we do want to hold fast to truth. We talked about integrity and pureness of heart. There are things that we need to stand for. It's confusing when you talk about peace because Jesus says, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. And yet, he is the peace of God. And he has made a way for us to have peace with God and one another. When real peace comes, it is not because we avoid issues. Listen to me. This is going to be important for you guys as you go through life. Real peace does not come from the avoidance of issues, but because issues are resolved. And it turns the corner. It becomes something other than it was. That's real peace. And so if we want to look at Jesus as the Prince of Peace, God who is a God of all peace, we need to recognize a couple of things. I just want to talk about a couple of things. First of all, we need to have peace with God, and we need to encourage others to have peace with God. Romans chapter 5, verse 1, having therefore been justified by faith, we now have peace with the Father through our Lord Jesus Christ. You know when you're saved, you're not saved from the devil, you're not saved from sin, you're saved from the wrath of a holy God. And no longer are you there in enmity, now you're at peace with God. And the whole world needs to know that message. And so you share the peace of God by sharing the gospel. But there's this whole thing about relationships as well. Romans 14, 9 says that we should live, we should have peace in relationships. In the issues of life, they come and go. There are little irritations in life and relational conflicts that will show up around you, particularly among believers. You should be a peacemaker. You should let love cover, cover a multitude of sins. You should swallow your pride. You should take the high ground and admit wrong when you're wrong and forgive the, in the injury, mercy, pure in heart, and peacemaker. These all go together. Don't turn everything that's ever done to you in some massive issues. Jesus said, have peace with one another. Yeah. Young people, one of the signs of maturity is knowing when something's important and something's not. And those who create drama take every little offense and every little, it take offense where none is intended and take hurts where none is intended. And even if it's intended, if it's just against me and it's not significant and it's minor, you let those go. You let love cover a multitude of sins. You don't take every little thing and turn it into a massive conflict. Another way that we become peacemakers, frankly, I'm just going to say this. So sometimes peacemakers don't say anything except to God, but other times... You become a peacemaker by not tearing others down, by not gossiping, by not telling people they're so bad at basketball they couldn't even dribble down their chin. Peacemakers don't give excuses for what they did that might have caused conflicts, willing to accept responsibility for what they've done, always looking to how they can strengthen relationships, be a peacemaker. And so the application point there is to make it your practice to connect people with God and with one another make it your practice to be a connector not a divider not someone who stirs up in, 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 in injury you're working toward reconciliation God has given us the ministry of reconciliation you want to unite people with God in repentance and faith and you want to unite people with one again one another the Bible talks so much about unity and I want you to know something sometimes people think well we're at peace just because there's not active war, there's more to this. It is proactive. It is resolution of conflict, and it is cooperation and a sharing of hearts and minds together. Now, is everybody going to like you when you're merciful and when you live with integrity and sincerity and when you actively promote peace? Is everybody going to be pleased with you? Well, let's, let's think about it for a moment. Was Jesus merciful? Was he pure in heart and perfectly righteous? Did he promote peace with God? Did everybody like him? They nailed him to a cross. They reviled him and they persecuted him. And here's a promise for you. There are going to be hard days. There are going to be days when people criticize you when they persecute you, when they 
tear you down. They're going to be, your friends are going to laugh at you and ridicule you. Some people won't be your friend. As it was in Jesus' day, it will be in yours. Some of you are not going to be able to continue at the job you're at because of the way that business does business. And if you're pure in heart and your integrity, your integrity is intact, you can't glorify God in that workplace. Some of you are going to be godly and pursue righteousness and you're going to be kind and you're going to stand on truth and you're going to seek to unite people with God and your family is going to hate you for it. They're going to call you, I don't know what they're going to call you, goody two-shoes, I don't know. They're going to call you something. And they're going to criticize you and they're going to tear you down and they're going to look for cracks in your armor and in your righteousness. Most of us won't go to prison for the name of Christ. Most of us won't be beheaded or, 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 or tortured for the name of Christ, even though that was what took place here for many of these Christians. But we need to be ready to face whatever the world and those who don't know Christ have for us because of the faithfulness of God. You're blessed when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely. They lie about you. You're to rejoice and be glad. Why? Because your reward is great in heaven and you're in good company. They persecuted the prophecies before you. Listen, what I want you to be willing to do is to joyfully pay the price of loving Jesus. Can I tell you something about Romans chapter 10 that most people overlook? When it says if you want to be saved, you should confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. That little phrase, confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, that means to say Jesus is Lord. Jesus is the only Lord. He's the only one I'm going to bow down to. He's the only one I'm going to follow. He's my Lord. He's the only Lord. The problem with it in the time of Christ was there's this guy named Caesar. He was over all the Roman kingdom, and they, it was worldwide. I mean, it went all the way from Asia all the way to Western Europe. It went very far north. It went south to the seas. And, and the way that they were uniting all these cultures, they said, well, we need some sort of kind of religious thing that, because everybody likes religion, and so we'll manipulate people. And so here's what we'll say. We'll say Caesar, in Greek, Kaiser, is Lord, Kurios, Kaiser Kurios. And at least once a year, everybody has to come and just be in agreement and say, Kaiser Kurios, Caesar is Lord. Now, here's the problem. Those who gave their lives to Christ would not say it. They would only say, Christ, Jesus, is Lord and Lord alone. Now, the penalty for not affirming Kaiser Kurios Caesar is Lord, was death. It wasn't always, it wasn't always executed. It wasn't always executed immediately, but there are historians who have recorded the streets of Rome where Christians would gather in groups when they would go around saying, you must affirm Caesar is Lord. And the Christians would say, we cannot, for Jesus is Lord. And they would kill them, and they would just pile their bodies up, put them on a cart, and carry them to pits to be buried. There's a cost. There's a cost to following the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's what I want you to know. He's worth it. He's worth it. He is worth your life. He gave his life for you. Greater love had no man than this, that he laid down his life for his friend. As he has given his life to you, you give your life to him. And you can rejoice because your reward is great upon this earth. He guards you. He protects you. He guides you. He's sufficient for you in what he allows you to walk through. But also your reward is great in heaven. I'd better quit. Merciful, pure in heart, peacemaking, enduring. That's the character God wants in you. Because that's his character. It's the character that he shapes and that he forms in us. Isn't God good? Graduates, Ella, Keegan, Donadia, Zion, you made it. Congratulations. Yeah, I think we ought to recognize that again. Good. Congratulations. Now, another phase of life begins. Live it 
to the glory of God. Father, I want to thank you just for the time that we've had today. For these lives that we celebrate, I want to thank you for the opportunity that we've had to just come and be reminded of the character of Christ that you are making within us. And I want you to remind us that blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs are the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. As we mourn over our sin, you comfort us. Blessed are the meek, the humble, those who don't come to you in arrogance or with an agenda or with some sense of entitlement but those who kneel at the foot of the cross, for they shall see God. Father, we want to thank you for the character that you display in Christ and then that you give us. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Christ, you are righteousness. Make us desire your righteousness and your goodness. And then as you do that, you pour mercy upon us and help us to be those who reflect your mercy to others. As we do that, Father, in your goodness and in your kindness, you, you, you can help us to be pure in heart as you wash us and you cleanse us from the filth of our own sin and our own desires and you replace it with your righteousness. Just like with Saul, you put a new heart in us. And then, Father, as we, as, as we walk with you, we are able to, to be at peace with you and to help bring peace to those who are around us we're able to live insofar as it lies within us peaceably with all men and father you're glorified in our lives as we do so the world's not going to like it they hated you they hate your followers and i pray father that you will just help us to to be strong be with these young people help us to be strong to be enduring to stand fast when life gets hard, it's so easy to quit, so easy to sit down, so easy to just graduate and want to go home and take a nap. And yet that's not what you call us to. You call us to faithful obedience, to, to responsibility, to privilege of service, to yieldedness, to a life that matters. In whatever sphere, in whatever geographic location, in whatever sphere of influence you provide for us, you call us to that. Help us to realize this not because of our merit, but because of the righteousness of Christ, his merit that you have imputed to us. In your name I pray. Amen.